The content of this channel is for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advised. What's good, everybody? <laughs> I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chasers. So uh, before we get things started, I want to give a shout out to all of the members of the Green Gorilla Channel, and I got to hit them off with some fanfare.
Yes, I'd like to give a shout out to any of you, Ronan Martin, Black Wizard, ADOS, Camp Low, Isa Abdul Sahir, Anthony Taylor, Deshaun Nolly, Ab Media 83, Aaron Loy, Leroy Honeycutt, MLR, Julius Ferguson, Charles Rogers, Black Dog, Brother Love, Ryan Jackson, Infamous Chillin', Randall, Universal 178, Black Sword 404, Rashid Barnes, Aaron Smith, The Walt Diddy Show, DH, C Truth, The Revelator, Gold Professor, The Nameless Protagonist, Black Pill Ned Stark, Author Unknown, Odd Collard, Roderick Jackson, Dr. Tiasan Johnson, Brian Williams, Kalan Jakala, Sherrod Martin, Ricky Dawson, Cedric Bowman, Truth. 7360, BK Born Shahi, James Washington, Hostel ADEP, Seven Coast Dojo, Shop Talk Live, WPR1, Roguish the Buildmonger, I Care, Force Windu, Lady Miss Thing Green, BGS Ivmore, and Marvin Battle Jr. Thank you so much for being members of the Green Gorilla Channel. Thank you. Thank you for being members. Thank you for being members of the Green Gorilla Channel. And you too can become a member of the Green Gorilla Channel. And if you want information on how to, here's how to. What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely. Straight up, no chaser. Today, I want to introduce you to my new membership program that consists of five levels where you can invest in the Green Gorilla channel on a monthly basis and receive level-specific perks. Memberships are special because they improve the quality of the content of the channel and will help me to be able to keep the channel going. Now, to participate in the Green Gorilla channel membership program, all you have to do is hit the Join button, which is located right next to the Subscribe button on my channel page. Now for all of my subscribers who decide not to participate in my membership program, nothing will change. The content will keep coming the way it always has. Thanks for watching and be careful out here people. Bless. Before I get started, I'd like to give a shout out to Cedric Bowman who hit me up on the Cash App. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. And look, let me just say this. Strike the thumbs up button if you like. If you care, go ahead and share. If you want to know when I go live, then go ahead and subscribe. Be a good patron and make a donation. It's a real simple solution. Just make a contribution. No need for heavy lifting, just a little bit of gifting. And if you like the show, the evidence will show in your benevolence. So that's my pitch right there. But anyway, uh, I want to get down to business here. And today is the last installment of a series of, video, uh, of videos I'm doing on democracy. And so it's not going to be sensational. I'm not going to be hooping and hollering. Uh, but I am going to try to give you, to the best of my ability, some information on what democracy is, what it's not, and uh, how to make critical evaluations of what's going on in the political landscape of the United States. Uh, and so the first thing I did was I, you know, before I even got started, I kind of gave everyone the characterization that's most often uh, used as it pertains to examining and looking at American democracy. And typically, people perceive it as a voting procedure that tabulates the fixed interest of private persons. So it's kind of like a market activity, an economic activity, insofar as people pursue their own individual or their private interest, and they use the logic of strategic decision in order to get the best deal for themselves. But then there's another way of perceiving democracy called deliberative democracy. Some people call it a participatory democracy. And instead of private interest being the paramount concern, public good and public reason 
is that which is of paramount concern. So instead of just trying to find out what's best for you, you try to find out it related to deliberating about a matter. What is in the public good? What's the public interest related to a policy initiative, an act, or a piece of legislation, or even a politician? Will this politician act in such a way that they're serving the public as opposed to merely the private interest of a specific set of constituents? Okay? Now, what I've done is I've already explained uh, to the best of my ability. I've explained to you that as it pertains to deliberative democratic theory, there's something called a classical deliberation model. And for the most part, the classical deliberation model is meant to keep deliberation going in the presence of deep-seated uh, disagreement. Right? And I think, I think, I see Keep It 100 in the uh, audience right now. I think he'll, to some degree, uh, be, you know, empathetic to this kind of claim. But ultimately, these people argue that in American culture and in Western democratic societies, there's something called moral pluralism. Meaning that there are people who have different views about what's right and wrong pertaining to a whole host of issues. Like you got pro-lifers on one side. You got pro-choices on another side. You got people who are for and against the death penalty. You got people who are for and against gun control. You got people who are for or against abortion. People who are for or against euthanasia. People who are atheists and then people who are deeply religious. Devout Christian, you know, conservatives. And then you got these radical socialist leftists. So the argument, you know, is that there's moral pluralism, and we need to adopt some kind of regulative principles in order to keep deliberation going. Because even amidst all of this disagreement on moral issues, we still have to make decisions related to how to govern the country. It still has to be done. So what they argue is, is that we need to adopt the principles of reciprocity, publicity, and accountability. And in that way, we can at least ensure that we can keep the deliberation about what's going on in, as it pertains to decision making going. We can keep it going. Now, there's a, another philosopher that I covered last time. Her name is Iris Marion Young. She wrote a book called Democracy and Inclusion. And for the most part, she argues against Amy Gutman and Dennis Thompson. And basically she says, people don't pre-commit to principles in the real world when they're having an argument. <laughs> they just don't. They just argue, right? And they just try to figure out in a concrete context what kind of decision they're going to reach predicated upon their own kind of reasons. They don't have to have reasons ahead of time or a set of principles that they consider to be fair ahead of time. They just try to hash it out the best they can, given the circumstances that they're given. OK. However, though. Despite. That fact. Iris Young still understands that if a decision is going to be fair. At all, if a decision is going to be fair as it pertains to participation or deliberation, it has to be set up in such a way that everyone whose interest is affected by a decision has to be included in the process in which the decision is made. So if you're going to be impacted by a specific piece of legislation, you ought to have a say in it. If an act is going to impact or affect your life, you ought to have some sort of say in it. You ought to be able to step up in the fora or the forum and be able to speak your piece about it, have others listen to what you have to say and take it and take it into consideration as they uh, ultimately make their decision or vote. OK. Now, according to Irish Young, there's two ways to promote the aim of making sure that everybody participates in these kind of processes. And basically, she says, on the one hand, you could expand modes of communication which people deem to be acceptable in 
spaces where deliberation is taking place. And then on the other hand, she says, you could uh, uh, basically meet this aim or promote this aim by actively democratizing the state. Now, we're going to come back to this because this is where tokenism comes into play. Because ultimately, one could argue that the democratizing of the state or the democratization of the state can lead to tokenism, which is ineffective and unimpactful in the long run. And that's what we want to actually get to. But I got to take you through a series of arguments so that you can understand where this is going. And this is the last piece of this. This is the capstone of everything I've been arguing thus far. And it's just going to demonstrate to you why, you know, at the current moment, you got a lot of people who are engaged in identity politics and they feel that they want their people to be visible in offices. A lot of black people want to see black people in office. A lot of black people want to see black women in office. A lot of black people want to see black men in office. But the point is, the active democratization of the state can oftentimes lead to a kind of symbolic tokenism, which really doesn't have any substantive impact on the direction in which the country is moving one way or the other, to the right or to the left. Okay? So that ultimately, that will be the conclusion. All right? So, again, going back to Young, before I move off into the next thinker, she says that political communication can become exclusionary such that people are left out of the process through external exclusion and through internal exclusion. Now, external exclusion occurs by means of backdoor brokering. That, if, if backdoor brokering is going on, you, you're not even privy to the real kind of reasons that are given back and forth, and you're not even made aware of what the decision is going to be. You're left out of the loop. Private committees, wealthy persons who are able to manipulate the media, that's just being excluded from decision making altogether. But she also makes mention of the fact that you could actually be present and be amidst people who are making decisions and still be left out and still not be able to have an impact over the decision making process for several reasons. Uh, one of them is because she argues that within these spaces, there's a privileging of argumentation. And that privileging of argumentation leaves people out of the process because they don't communicate as effectively as some other groups of people who have a certain kind of cultural expression and a certain kind of cultural capital. All right. So to remedy, remedy this problem, she says that we can expand modes of communication in political fora such as greeting, rhetoric, and narrative, and that will help to allow these people who've, who are internally excluded to become more uh, substantively impactful in their ability to impact or, or, or to influence decision making. All right, so that's, that's what she says, okay? But here comes along a man by the name of John Dryzak, okay? Now, John Dryzak wrote a book called uh, Discursive Democracy, and he wrote a book called uh, Democracy in Capitalist Times. He's a philosopher and a political theorist. And uh, so he has some serious reservations with this entire approach to democracy. And he thinks that, you know, it, it leads to inauthentic participation in the democratic process. And I tend to agree with him. OK, so. The first thing that John Dryzek does is he comes along and he admits, OK, so I'll agree with you. Modes of communication other than argument ought to be allowed in deliberative democratic context. But if we're going to allow for these expanded modes of communication to be present, what we need to do is administer two tests to determine the validity of the use of these different forms of communication. So the first thing he says that must be done is any communication that involves coercion or the threat of coercion should be excluded. Right now we've recently seen displays in which people have been coercive in the context 
of expanded modes of communication related to democracy. I mean, like, say, for example, and this is just an example, Brittany Cooper telling Ice Cube, fuck you. That's not that's not a, a proper approach to dealing with a democratic deliberative situation because they don't think like you do or because you feel like they are somehow stymieing your strategic goal of having a specific person or group of persons elected right because that kind of stymies what you consider to be progress for you you don't come in and then tell people fuck you that's coercion or you don't threaten members of your constituency by telling them i'll never forgive you if you don't vote for x or y that is coercion and it shouldn't be allowed within the context of deliberative engagement but it happens it does happen but when it does happen you have to be able to articulate to these persons that they are violating democratic norms they're being anti-democratic so he says that it has to meet that test the, the, the speech the expanded modes of speech can't be coercive and then secondly he says any communication that cannot connect the particular to the general should be excluded that's just a fancy way of saying that if your self-interest can't be generalized, then that kind of speech is not acceptable. I mean, if you go on with a narrative that only benefits you and it has no benefit for anyone else beyond or besides you, then that's illegitimate speech, especially in a collective decision making process. Nobody gives a fuck about just hearing what is germane to you, especially if it's just only you and it does better for everyone else. Or even you could say if it's just for your specific constituency or your interest group because other people are going to be impacted by your decision making or who's elected right or the policy or the act or whatever right so anyway those are the two tests that he introduces in order to ensure that alternative modes of communication which are intended to increase inclusiveness that they don't do the exact opposite which is create exclusiveness right so that's the first thing that he does in order to attack young's position all right and, and and i'll say this i'll just admit openly i used to think that irish young had the stronger position i now think that dryzek has the stronger position and i'll explain to you why and this is primarily because i wrote a whole host of philosophy prior to Obama becoming the president of the United States but when he became the president of the United States and I saw the ways in which he spoke to change and touted change but that he didn't actively in the eight years that he was the president usher in or bring about paradigmatic change I then realized that the democratization of the state or having people be included within the confines of the state doesn't necessarily bring about an attendant increase of uh impact in decision making for marginalized groups it, it just doesn't it, it's tokenism okay so anyway so having said that uh what i'm going to do is take a real quick break and then come back and then get into the meat of what dryzek says about iris young because he has a a whole section uh on tokenism and why it fails every time and I want to go through that and so I can once and for all tell people and let them know in my own unique language stop advocating for this stop trying to promote and push the visibility of certain groups it it may do something to your ego but it's not going to do anything to change the structural conditions of black people in the United States it's, it's not and if we want that structural change, then we have to do things that are different. But of course, the black custodial political class, they don't want those kind of changes to occur. They just want to be the HNICs, the head niggas in charge, the head boule managers. But it is what it is. So I'll be right back in a quick second. And when we come back, I'm going to come back with John Jizek's approach to why Irish Young's uh, call for inclusion within a democratic state, especially a capitalist state, is uh, misdirected. 
All right. So I'll be right back in a second. And after that, we'll get right to it. So we're back. I'm the G with a PhD. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chaser. So let's get right into this. Well, actually, before I get right into it, I want to give a shout out to uh, Forrest Windu. Thank you for the donation, my brother. I want to give a shout out to Rasheed Barnes. Thank you so much for the donation, my brother. I appreciate that. And I don't know how many other people have made contributions or have not. I've not been keeping my eye on that. Because I'm just trying to get through this uh, this lecture. And I don't want to be here all night. Because I know this is uh, a little bit terse. And it's not uh, full of vibrant and, uh, you know, emotional language. But I, I want to walk through this theory so that you can have it at your fingertips. When we make comments about people who consider themselves to be public figures. And acting in the best interest of the black community. So we can call them out. That's, this is why I'm doing this, okay? So uh, let me just get right into it, okay? Now, again, as ultimately, all I've been trying to do is just outline some of the main themes of classical and revised models of deliberative democratic theory. So what I want to do now is move past the examination that I did of John Dryzek and move to uh, something else. So re recently what I just did was I talked about his protest against uh, allowing for expanded modes of communication without certain conditions being met. So, but right now what I would like to do, I want to examine Dryzek's argument that Irish Young's theory of democracy is flawed because it encourages non-authentic democratic inclusion. Now, what does that mean? All right. I want you to understand to have at least a marginal, a cursory, a minimum understanding of Dryzek's theory of deliberative democracy by exploring what he thinks is the manner, M-A-N-N-E-R, and space, S-P-A-C-E, in which he thinks the deepening of democratization of the state most fruitfully occurs, especially in a capitalist state, okay? Because we live in a capitalist state, and it ain't going nowhere. It's not happening, buddies. You, if you think that corporatism is going somewhere and capitalism is going somewhere, you are misguided. You're deluded. Business runs America. Walmart runs America. Amazon.com runs America. GE runs America. <laughs> right? You better you better be aware of it, okay? So now according to Dryzek, there are three criteria. Three. Three criteria that can be used to determine the quality and the depth of democratization in capitalist states. You have franchise, you have scope and authenticity. You got FSA or FAS, however you want to remember it as an acronym, you got franchise, scope, and authenticity. So what is franchise? Franchise is basically the number of people involved in a political process. That's all it is, okay? Scope regards the domain of life under democratic regulation or what you're actually talking about. What's the scope and range of what you can have a conversation about 
as it pertains to democracy or decision making. And then lastly, authenticity refers to the degree to which democratic influence is substantive rather than symbolic. So you got the number of people involved, the scope and the range of what they can actually have a discussion about. And then lastly, you have authenticity, which is the degree to which your influence is substantive as opposed to symbolic. Now, Dryzek, the first thing he's going to do, he's going to admit, look, it is true. A positive increase in any of these criteria points towards democratization, meaning it increases or enhances democracy. Right? The, although, though, he, he acknowledges this, he provides guidelines for the application of these three criteria. Now, the first guideline he comes up with is that none of the dimensions, okay? Actually, let me go back. None of the dimensions of this criteria, of these criteria, should be sacrificed for the sake of another. So that's the first guideline, right? And the second guideline is that None of the dimensions should be sacrificed in the short term for the sake of all of them or any of them in the long term. Now, that's a lot to take in and I understand, but I got to keep it pushing. OK, so he says, although these criteria and guidelines for their application, it seems simple and relatively straightforward. But it's important not to go over them quickly because it's crucial. And I say it's crucial to understanding his core criticism of people who seek for active democratization of the state like Irish Young. So this is what he believes, Drozek does. He says, okay, when you increase franchise, when you extend franchise, you neglect scope and authenticity. Or when you extend franchise to the neglect of scope and authenticity, the people who are recently enfranchised are subject or vulnerable to manipulation. So let me restate that again. When you extend franchise, the number of people to the neglect of being aware of what's going on related to scope and authenticity, the people who are recently enfranchised are vulnerable to manipulation. So what does he do? He points this out by illustrating how democracy is paradoxically weakened through the use of public referendums. You would think that more people having the capacity to make decisions, right, related to referenda would create more democracy. But he's going to say, well, actually, it, it, it doesn't. And this is what he says. And this is an old quote. He says, and, and it's funny about this, man. These theories are old as shit. This is like 1990 shit. It's not 2020 shit. This is like 30 years old. So, but anyway, he says, every two years, my former state of Oregon presents around 20 statewide ballot initiatives. The results rarely contribute to a flourishing democracy and instead often undermine constitutive democratic values of equality and tolerance. A 1990 measure was passed purportedly to reduce property taxes of ordinary citizens, but in reality to shift the burden of taxation away from corporations and onto, in, uh, and onto individuals. Every two years, a new attempt is made to brand homosexuality as abnormal and force the state to repress gay rights, each time coming very close to passing. The use of referenda to repress unpopular minorities is equally apparent in California, where in 1994, immigrants were the target. On the other side of the coin, initiatives that would protect the environment or consumers are normally defeated after massive no campaigns financed by corporate wealth. So those are examples he uses. I'm not saying I agree with them or disagree with them at this point, but those are examples he, he uses. He's saying that as it pertains to consumer protectionism, typically what the wealthy do or what lobbyists for multinational corporations do is they come out and they create advertisements that basically tell people to say no to the passing of things that are in their self-interest. 
Okay? So the point here is that the extension of franchise unchecked often degrades the quality of public opinion, which may threaten the quality of democracy itself. Now, so he says the extension of franchise without the extension of scope and authenticity is not good. But then the next thing he does is he says that the unchecked extension of scope is as equally hazardous as the unchecked extension of franchise. But only this time, the overextension of scope has the potential to produce what he calls uh, paradox or totalitarianism, right? The potential for paradox ensues from the scarcity of time that each person can dedicate to political participation. So if one expands scope too far, citizens will be oversaturated with demands for uh, participation in the democratic process that will fatigue them, leading to a decrease in franchise. Also, he says, overextension of scope diminishes authenticity by stretching citizens' epistemic capacities or their knowledge-based capacities. So in the same way that a jack of trades individual is a master of no trades, the citizens that is uh, the citizen that's forced to know too much about too many issues is incompetent. You, you can't do it all. Okay? So the extension of franchise without safeguards has the potential also to slide over into totalitarianism as when incompetent or overzealous citizens seek to eliminate more and more spaces that are traditionally regarded as private. And then the last thing he says is that the unconstrained pursuit of democratic authenticity leads at an extreme to democracy that privileged uh, for the privileged few on a narrow range of issues. So in this instance, as it pertains to authenticity, if you if you ask for too much authenticity without also being aware of what needs to be extended in relation to franchise and scope, you get the over overemphasis, which leads to elitism. Which basically says ordinary citizens, because they lack virtue and understanding, cannot actually practice democracy. Also, overemphasis on an authenticity restricts scope by eliminating the range of issues deemed suitable for public review. So in other words, certain realms of inquiry are depoliticized. So to sum it up, Drozek basically argues that a deepening of democracy occurs when a positive movement is made in the way of franchise, scope, and authenticity together, but never at the expense of any of the others. So balance is required amongst all of these features. And if the balance is off, then democratization is thwarted. So now we know the manner in which democratization takes place. It takes place with a balance amongst franchise, authenticity, and scope. Now the question is, what is the space in which democratization is most effective? Now, oddly enough, he thinks that democracy through exclusion is the most authentic and the most advantageous space to practice it. And I'll get to why in a quick second. Just give me a second to breathe here and I can get right to it. So in order to distinguish the space in which the deepening of democracy takes place for Drozak, I want to turn to a passage that he wrote in a book called Democracy in Capitalist Times. And this is what he says. Deeper democratization of the capitalist state is not an impossibility, but the circumstances in which it can be pursued fruitfully and profoundly are quite rare. More ordinary circumstances allow only marginal democratization. Venues for democratization that try to stand apart from the state are not always completely beyond the reach of these constraints. But the opportunities they present for a deeper democracy are often more substantial. The most secure of all public spheres, whose very identity is defined by opposition to the state, providing that they can resist the temptation of entry onto conventional state policies, now, what does this mean? What does this actually mean? Because it, it sounds abstract. So what I want to do is just 
flesh out the contours of Drazek's argument and get to the essence of his theory of democratization. But to do that, it's necessary to lay out a list of the patterns of capitalist states and the arrangement of them, which represents two dimensions along which capitalist states can absorb the interest of its citizens. Now, on one dimension, there are exclusive or inclusive patterns of interest representations. Now, this is where it gets abstract. Inclusive representation is open to interest defined on any basis. But exclusive representation ensures that some interests will be excluded while guaranteeing that specific others will be acknowledged. So that's one dimension. On another dimension, the representation of interest can be either active or passive. Active refers to public policy consciously designed to recognize and then include or exclude particular interests. But passive indicates indifference to the identity of interest included or excluded. So I know that's a lot to take in, and I don't have a chart to show it, but just trust what I'm saying here. There, in light of this taxonomy that he just drew out, there are four distinct ways in which capitalist states can be arranged. They can be arranged such that they're either passive, inclusive. They can be arranged such that they're active, inclusive. They can be passive, inclusive. I mean, excuse me, passive, exclusive or active, exclusive. So let me repeat that because I fucked it up. There are four ways that capitalist states can be arranged. They can be arranged such that they are passive, inclusive, active, inclusive. Passive exclusive or active exclusive. And what follows is a brief description of each one of these kinds of states and their merits or demerits. And then after that, you'll understand why tokenism won't help. It won't democratize the state authentically the way that people think that it can. Okay? Now, let's talk about the passive inclusive state. Okay? The problem with the passive inclusive state is that by saving every social movement a place at the state's bargaining table, an authentic and thriving public sphere shrinks as all principles are converted to interest on the same level. Let me repeat that. Passive inclusive states incorporate every social movement and gives every social movement a place at the bargaining table. And by doing so, it shrinks all principles to the same level. All principles are converted to interest on the same level. So the unfortunate effect of this leveling is pluralism, in which policies favored by some interest will obligatorily be vetoed by the state. And for this reason, right, or the reason for this, is that states are hamstrung by certain imperatives or core functions. This is just the way capitalist states are arranged. There are certain imperatives that states are hamstrung by. If they don't, if they don't observe what those imperatives are, they don't secure longevity or stability. Now, what are the core functions of the state? Right? The core functions of the state constitute, uh, constitute the essential areas of state activity. All significant matters relating to national security and foreign policy, fiscal, monetary, and trade policy, the welfare state, civil and criminal justice, environmental and natural resource policy are located in the core. Let me repeat that so you're not unaware of it, so you can't say I didn't give it to you. The core functions of the state constitute the essential areas of state activity. All significant matters relating to national security and foreign policy. That's a state imperative. All significant matters relating to Fiscal, monetary, and trade policy. 
significant matters relating to the welfare state, civil and criminal justice, environmental and natural resource policy are located in the core of state imperatives. So the idea here is that when a social movement is indiscriminately absorbed into the state and it does not match up with a specific set of state imperatives or core functions, that movement loses vigor and viability. Which the movement would other words, uh, otherwise preserve if it was to remain excluded from the state. So you don't want to have your movement absorbed into a passive inclusive state that takes every interest in and levels it and regards it as equally important to any other. You're going to get lost in the sauce, is what he's saying. So the next thing he does is he talks about difficulties associated with active inclusive states. So we saw a passive inclusive state. Now we're going to talk about an active inclusive state. And he says, although active inclusive states are less pronounced than those of passive inclusive states, the difficulties that is, the difficulties are still important to acknowledge. So he, he basically says by allowing victimized groups to have added state power as is promoted by what's called difference democracy. And difference democracy is trying to get marginalized groups to be interpolated into the state. Okay? By allowing victimized groups to have added state power, competition over victim status ensues. This creates, in Dreisek's words, a pathological culture of victimhood. <laughs> it seems like where we are now. Rather than seek sponsorship and certification by administrative hierarchy, marginalized groups would do better to assert and negotiate their identity, their rights, and their unique perspectives in civil society. So rather than seek sponsorship and certif uh, certification by administrative hierarchy by the state, marginalized groups would do better to assert and negotiate their rights, their identity, and their perspectives in civil society in order to avoid the oppression Olympics. Now, at this point, what Dryzek begins to explain is the benefits of state exclusion, which he thinks fosters thriving and active public spheres. Now, I don't know if you know what a public sphere is, but it's a place where people talk and communicate about what's in the public interest by means of the media, over YouTube, over social media, over a whole host of, of, of media, okay? Now, he argues that although people and groups may be excluded from the state, you might not have a seat at the table with the state, it does not necessarily follow from this that they are excluded from politics. Let's, let's get this straight. Like, a lot of people continuously complain about there's not enough representatives for us in the politics. We're not enough in the politics. not enough in the politics. So fucking what? There's not enough of you in the politics. Because you could be in the space and still not be regarded as important while you exist within the space. Is what I'm talking about. You could be all up in the space and get lost in the sauce. Or you could be all up in the space and instead of doing something productive, instead you're playing the oppression Olympics. So he says, exclusion is the most promising within a passive exclusive state as opposed to active exclusive states. Okay, now what does this mean? You want a passive exclusive state and not an active exclusive state. But what is an active exclusive state? Well, an active exclusive state is a liberal authoritarian state. An example of which is the United States. The United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, 
Why are they active exclusive? Why? Because they're committed to free market ideas inspired by economists like Milton Friedman, F.A. Von Hayek, and so on and so forth. The problem with such states is that they attack their citizens by promoting and producing economically rationalistic and aggressively individualistic actions which are devastating for democratic politics, be it inside or outside of the state. Now he says these kind of states are bad for the environment because they prefer economic growth to sustainability. So what they do is they get people to think about being economically rationalistic and aggressively individualistic which is a threat to democracy and also is bad for the environment. Now, according to Drozek, the best kind of state is the passive exclusive state, not an active exclusive state, but a passive exclusive state, which he refers to as a corporatist state. The examples of which are Norway, Austria, Germany, and the Netherlands. Now, Drozek prefers these kind of states because they're more effective at promoting economic growth while regulating financial markets and more effective at providing rough material equality for their citizens, but at the same time enhancing individual freedom. Corporate states are less deadly to democracy beyond the state because the members of new social movements in such states do not look to the government to help advance their objectives. So the point here is that the existence of new social movements are much more precarious in liberal authoritarian societies like the United States than they are in corporatist societies because in liberal authoritarian societies, such movements are despised by capitalists and the states that are beholden to them for their survival and maintenance. So that's a lot to take in. You might have to go back and listen to this for a few times or listen to it a few times. OK, but the whole the, the point he's making is that. If you're going to have a social movement, it's best that you have a social movement. In. A. A state that's passive. Exclusive. So neither passive inclusive, active inclusive, nor active exclusive states absorb the interest of citizens in a satisfactory way. What passive inclusive states tend towards is leveling and pluralism. Active inclusive states encourage the politics of victimhood and promote dysfunction through identity norms. Active exclusive states accept gross inequality and in concert with capitalists attack the members of emerging social movements. Passive exclusive states are more benign in that they provide for the balanced interests of both corporations and labor. And this affords the members of new social movements in such states the opportunity to emerge in a thriving and flourishing political environment. In all cases, the space in which democracy is most potent is civil society, leaving efforts to democratize the state as futile. And this is especially so for liberal authoritarian states such as the United States and the United Kingdom. You're not going to be able to democratize the state. And when you do democratize the state and you do get your people in there, you're going to be a token. You're going to be leveled off. Your interests are going to be perceived as less than or less important than the primary functions of the state itself, which if I have to go back and explain it to you again, the core functions of the state constitute the essential areas of state activity. All significant matters relating to national security and foreign policy, fiscal, monetary and trade policy, the welfare state, civil and criminal justice, environmental and natural resource policy are at the core. Dealing with racial issues, not at the core. Dealing with 
Making sure black people get reparations, not at the core. However, foreign and national security, right at the core. Making sure that businesses remain afloat as opposed to private or individual citizens, that is a primary concern. Yes, there's a welfare state that exists, but it's limited, especially in the United States, because the United States is an active, exclusive state. They actively exclude people from uh, participation in the political process. And they despise social movements. I mean, you fucking take a knee on a football field and people are ready to fucking kill you. This is how America, this is, this is America. So, I'm going to take a break really quick. And uh, John reads too much. I want to thank you for your, uh, your donation, sir. And look, I'll be right back. I, I got to take a break with this because this is a lot to absorb. But I want to give you the theory so that we can have competent and sophisticated conversations about politics in the United States as opposed to just continuously hashing out the same kind of narratives which leaves us mired in competition that will be fruitless in the end anyway. This is why I'm doing this. And I'm not doing it to besmirch re the reputation of any other demographic other than my own. But I'm saying there's got to be a better way than the way we're pursuing politics. And I, I tend to agree with John Dreisett that the state will get you lost in the sauce. It might appear to or seem to be working to the benefit of a certain set of constituencies, but in actuality, the state does nothing other than, for the most part, preserve its core functions. Now, if your movement matches up with or converges in interest with that of the state, well, then perhaps maybe you can gain some real estate. You can, you can move the needle. However, you will not move the needle if your interest does not converge with the interest of the core functions of the state, especially a capitalist state. So having said that, I'm going to take a, another break and then we'll come back in. And I'm going to allow you to, uh, if you got any comments that you want to make, if there's anything you didn't understand about what it is that I just articulated, I'll give you an opportunity to ask me a question. And I'm, I'm glad that you're still here. I, I had no idea that there would still be 130 people here after going through all that terse and uh, I would consider to be abstract thinking. But I'm glad that you are here. So let me take a break because I got to take a sip of some water real quick. And then when we come back, uh, hopefully there'll be some questions or I can kind of cap this all off and uh, move it, moving on to the next subject of discussion. Because even though it's theoretical and abstract, I want to concretize it. All right, I'll be back in a jiffy. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel. Please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell notification button. And please, feel free to share the video. Thank you. 
The content of this channel is for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advised. All right, we're back. And uh, at the present moment, I am joined by uh, a person who has helped me out uh, with some shows quite often. And I haven't had him on here for a good little while, but he's my buddy, my buddy and me. <laughs> what's, what's up, good? boy? Just what's good with you, bro, bro? What's good, motherfucker? Hi, what's man? good, man? How you doing, man? Listen, man, you know, I'm, 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 I'm cooking me a steak while listening. You know what I'm saying? You're saying some things in here, man. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt you, man. You know, I seen you posted the link, so I was like, fuck, you know, F it. F it. I'm going to keep it clean. F it, man. I'm going to just jump in there, man. Um, I ain't, I ain't got no long soliloquies to say, man. I, I, yo, I'm just, you know, what you're saying is, 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 is good shit because I feel like black people need, uh, you know, a, a, a overhaul in the politics department you know our politics are trash you've seen me say it numerous times on the internet man we need uh, a politics a political makeover in the black community and you know black culture in general you know what i'm saying so right. this is very 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 fucking necessary for all my friends very necessary you know and um shout out to everybody that's listening to this because it shows your interest you know, in, in, you know, uh, the idea that we need to make over in politics, especially black men, because as things progress, it is becoming more and more obvious that, you know, everyone is out for theirs and we have to be out for ours and we have to kind of separate ourselves as our own special interest group at this point. It's not even, it's no, it's no longer about black America anymore. I'm, I'm sorry to say that. But it's, it's, it's more about, you know, black men, because there is no one, no one, no one that's prioritizing the interests of black men, not 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 even our own women. I'm sorry to say it. It's just real. And look, and look, let me just say something about that, Marcus, man. Um, I think that black men at this moment, this juncture in time or being subjected to oppression and domination in the political realm or in the political sphere. Yeah. I mean, you see the outright coercion of black men to vote a specific kind of way yeah. and shaming. Yeah. Even the threat of the withholding of sex for not voting a specific kind of way. We've seen instances in which mothers have scolded their children yeah. for not voting in a specific kind of way. That's not democracy. <laughs> you, do you understand what I'm saying, Marcus? It's gynocracy, Bruh, This uh, that is oppression. I'm I'm not gonna refer to it as gynocracy at all. It is oppression. Okay, it because gynocracy doesn't give it the kind of service that it deserves. It is more pernicious than gynocracy because you one can argue you can have a relatively benign gynocracy. Not that it is, but it's it's possible theoretically. Textbook oppression. When you remove a alternative course of action from an individual, when you say there are two choices in front of you, A or B, and you tell someone, you better not choose A. You better not choose A. If you choose A, I'm gonna I'm going I never forgive you. If you choose A, I'm gonna knock you upside your head. If you choose A, I'm not gonna fuck you no more. That's uh, that's that is domination. That's coercion. You get what I'm saying, brother? I mean, they call it that when you know. I mean, if 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 someone is in a position of power, I mean, women women know what that looks like because they deal with it. If 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 someone is in a position of power and they say, you know, if you want to continue to work here, um, you, you gotta let me smash. Then they view precisely. That as, they they view that as coercion. But, you know, women, you know, tend to think that they can't be guilty of coercion. The, the thing is, what black men are being asked to do is vote a certain way or make decisions a certain way that have nothing to do with what they need or want. They, they, they are often told that uh, asking, you know, what's in it for me is, is toxic. You know? And look, let me just say this. When those kind of conditions obtain within the domain of the political, for anyone, it's bad for democracy in general. 
Okay, it, it, it's bad because what you're doing is you are restricting. You're doing the very thing that feminists have always argued against being done to them. Namely, yeah. being excluded from the domain of the political. So you can't, on the one hand, argue for inclusion within the domain of the political, but at the self-same time, prevent people from being involved in the domain of the political how they see fit as autonomous individuals. Well, you can't, that, is, that violates every norm of democracy that, that is known to democratic theorists. It just does. Okay? And so I would say that at this moment, black men have a narrative that hasn't been heard. So I'm go my, what I'm going to do is co-opt the language of feminism and yeah. use it against them. Because the norms that they say that they're abiding by or want to be want men to abide by, they're not abiding by themselves, which creates no. double standards, contradictions, uh, and all kinds of moral viciousness, right? So I'm of the opinion that if you want to play this game, it, it, at the current moment, I don't even think it's a game for us. It's justice. This, this has nothing to do with black men just doing what's in their interest. This is black men saving yeah. the integrity of democracy itself. Because well, this shit is not, there's no integrity in this. It's survival for us at this point. Survival. This is there's no integrity. Imagine me telling my girlfriend, if you don't vote for who I tell you to vote for, I'm not I'm not I'm not gonna pay your fucking uh get your hair done this week. I'm not gonna do your nails ever again. I'm not I'm matter of fact, you know what I'm saying? I'm never cutting the grass out, never wash your car again, bitch. Well they, just they, imagine that kind of conversation if if it was to occur. Well, I mean if it was to occur out loud. I mean, it, I'm sure it does occur, but, you know, uh, not not voting, though, but like, you know, anything else that a man might want a woman to do or else he'll withdraw his benevolence, they call that toxic. They call it toxic patriarchy, actually, because, you know, patriarchy is when you're taking care of people and, you know, taking care of women and children and shit like that, even though they trash patriarchy. But they will call that toxic patriarchy if you were to withdraw your support uh, by 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 way of, you know, being denied some action or service by women you know but it's never wrong when they do it if they tell you to do xyz or you can't have this or they won't do this or that or the other now they have used they, they're now using this in the political space they've, and, they've done it everywhere else and that you know women women are always using you know their 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 you know their sexual shit as some sort of passive aggressive way to get men to do what they need them to do, you know, before, you know, for, you know, protect and provide. Now it's vote for who we need you to vote for so we could have X, Y, Z, but we doing the voting are supposed to ignore what we are to gain or lose in the deal. So, so Marcus, let me, let me just say this again. It is, and I agree with everything you're saying. You're right. They're, they are being coercive, and they're not seeing their own contradiction, and they are applying a double standard. They are seeing it, fam. Well, they they, they see it, but, okay, they're not being shamed by it. They, they feel as if it is appropriate, but it's inappropriate. And we have to show them or demonstrate to them that we're not going to stand for that. That's bullshit. Now, put it this way. If you become acclimated to your own domination which is what that is it be accepting someone to saying to you if you don't do what i want you to do then i'm not going to fuck you mm -hmm. or if you don't do what i don't what i tell you to do i'll never forgive you or if you don't do what someone wants you to do then they smack you upside the head and curse you out and call you a traitor and so on and so forth See, this violates all of the norms. Now, men do this too. Now, we we are guilt, we're guilty. Of, even in the manosphere, we're just as guilty of it sometimes. Because I say some pretty deprecating things about women. Okay, <laughs> I'm just keeping it 100. You know, because I mean, black men are pissed off. We're angry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because some of the things that are happening to us are unjust, and we're not allowed to give voice to it without being immediately reduced to misogynistic. 
women hating, you know, uh, Philistines, which, which is not the case. Like men have feelings, men have needs and desires, and men have reasons for doing things just as much as women do. Men are fallible, yes, but so are women. Women can be coercive and violent, manipulative and exploitative and, and render men powers, powerlessness just like men can. Okay, so I think what's happening is there's been too much overshooting and not enough being honest and open and there hasn't been enough candid conversations that are, I won't necessarily say logic-based because they don't have to be logic-based. They just need to be happening. But right now they're not happening because black men are actually being excluded from the political process. And, and, and men are excluding themselves. This is the thing that's fucking me up. But yeah. don't don't leave, Marcus. I got I got another brother here I want to add to the stream. No, I'm I'm right here, bro. I ain't going nowhere. Sergeant, what's going on, my brother? How are you doing this evening? I'm Sergeant, doing well, if you're sir. not can you hear me well? I can hear you well. What's going on? Um, nothing much. Uh I just wanted to um if you if you had the time, share my testimony. Okay, you brothers, know, testify um, from a, a black male. I used to date. <laughs> yes, man. So um, she, she of course, is, you know, uh, completely pro-Democrat, and uh, Trump was seen as the enemy. And when I asked how important is this to her, she said it's the most important thing that is going to uh, happen is choosing the president. That's the most important thing that's going to happen this year. So I asked, how much time did you put into researching what bo um, both sides are presenting and see how it benefits you? Um, she says Trump is automatically against black women. And um, I was like, well, uh, is the other side also against black women? And are they also against black men? She said she doesn't care about black men first. So she supports black women first, all women second, and then black men. Well, you know what? That's unfortunate. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, look, at the end of the day, another thing that I want to do at some point, and thank you, my brother, for uh, coming in and uh, blessing us with your, your testimony, uh, yes, commensurate with your experience. But here's the deal, man. And this is what people are failing to acknowledge and to realize. Self-interest or the interest of a specific group is an abstraction because people do not exist in relation to or in terms solely of, of, of gender or sex. For example, let's say, for example, you're thinking about women first and you come up with policies and directives and acts that are only women friendly. But imagine that I'm a man, right? Of course I am. You, you can hear it in my voice, right? I'm a man. You know what I have? I have children. You know what, what sex those children are? They're girls. So if you fuck me over and you think only about yourself and what's only going to happen that's going to be advantageous to women or to girls in the long run, you think you're doing so in the long run. But in actuality, what you're doing is you're stuck. You're, if I don't do well generationally, my daughters are not going to do well generationally. I'm not going to have wealth to pass on to them. Exactly. So if you got all of these initiatives that seek to put women in a hierarchy above and beyond that of men or to give them a leg up while you stymie our development and our growth, you're stymieing the development and the growth of your own children, your own brothers, your own husbands. See, why, at least white people have some understanding, some semblance of understanding that these hard and fast delimitations, these assignments, these categorical assignments, they don't work in the long run. And I've, and I've been saying this, like white women can be feminists, hardcore feminists at the job. But guess what they do when they go home? They got fucking husbands. I've seen, dude, I've seen it to where a woman could be a feminist at the crib, I mean, at, at the school, and then openly say, well, you know, I'm a traditional woman at home. I've seen it. 
Like, well, I, you know, like this woman talking all this feminist shit at, at the job. And then she was like, well, you know, when I when it comes to, you know, my home or whatever, I know I make more money than my husband, but he's the one that controls all the money. He's the one that makes sure it goes where it goes. Like, huh? They operate differently. But our people, our women operate on the whole scheme of it's me, I'm in sole control, and if you don't beat to my drum, fuck everybody but me. We're the only group of people that play ball like that. And they think that they can win like this over the long haul. And the only way they could do it is to increasingly adopt a partner in the government, the federal government, which is the exact converse of what the conservatives say they want to do. They want to have more left into the hands of the private sphere. But these women are rushing head first into the state. And it is dangerous to give that much power to the state. You, These women have given the control of the education of their children over to the state. They've given over health care to the state. They've given over, you know, uh, a whole host of functions, it, housing to the state. Birth, the birthing of children to the state. This is dangerous, man. I don't, I don't understand what people don't understand. This is dangerous as fuck. Because the state, ultimately, you don't want to give that much power to any governmental organization and be dependent upon anyone for your sustenance in that de to that degree, to where all of your functions are dependent upon the state. You don't want that. And this is why I think Drysdale is important. But, uh, but I want to say some, some, two more things before I put y'all back into the, into the conversation, okay? So let me just wrap this up and say this, okay? Now. I've been talking to you, and what I read to you was very terse, and I admit it is. It was terse. It was, it was, you're going to have to go back and, and listen again and again if you want to catch the gist of what it is I was trying to articulate as I went through this, you know, this presentation. But ultimately, what I'm saying is, now that you know the manner and the space in which this philosopher named John Drozek, in which he thinks that the deepening of democracy occurs, you're in a position to understand why he thinks that inclusion into democracy actually promotes inauthenticity. First of all, let me just say this. Democratic authenticity to this man, John Dreisek, is achieved to the extent to which critical perspectives are directed against prevailing power structures. Especially those that steer liberal authoritarian states. So, in other words, authenticity is secured when communication produces non-coercive reflection upon and potential transformation of social and political ideals and preferences. And the best way to do this, the best way to gain this authenticity is through the contestation of discourses in a vital and an active public sphere. As opposed to the symbolic contestation that normally occurs within established state institutions, within legislatures, courts, state bureaucracies, etc. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have critical reflection within the context of prevailing power structures or that it never takes place within the context of state institutions, but it does so rarely. Once you set up an institution, it's difficult to dismantle that motherfucker. You think you're going to get rid of the welfare state? This is a humongous bureaucracy that is self-sustaining and self-justifying. And once a political uh, 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 bureaucracy begins to persist, it, the, the inertia of the damn thing is hard to disrupt. Once you set up these organizations, these bureaucracies, it's very difficult for them to change direction. This is why he's saying... All you really get is tokenism. You're not going to change the trajectory of the state by putting a Negro actor in it. Now, let me sprinkle in a little pepper in these state institutions. What, what the fuck changes are you going to make? You mean so you mean you're going to have a bigger influence or an impact than these multinational corporations that keep the infrastructure of the government going? That they can't exist without it? The government can't exist without their help and their, and their cooperation. 
No. And then, and then look, what he says is, look, critical reflection. If there is to be any within these institutions, state institutions, whatever, it's only enhanced when there's a strong civil component to counterbalance the coerciveness of state imperatives. If there's no strong, a strong civil sphere, you don't even have the capacity to push back against the coercion within the state apparatus. Is what I'm saying. So the, just getting a whole bunch of Negroes in the state is not going to make a change. The Congressional Black Caucus ain't made a change. And there's a reason for it. Black people had a lot of momentum during the civil rights movement until they became part of the state apparatus. Then guess what? Everything deflated like a true fiend's weight. Is what happened. And look, beyond that, he also argues it's difficult to democratize liberal authoritarian states because transnational corporations have co-opted them to such an extent that the public officials in the state are afraid of capital flight, which capital flight is, oh, you ain't going to give me what I want, motherfucker. I'm going to take my business elsewhere. I'm going to take my Walmart down the street. And if a politician is fearful, a mayor, a governor, a senator is afraid of capital flight, it's going to limit their ability to engage in earnest dialogue that is going to go against capitalist concerns. So the, again, the most secure pocket in which authentic deliberation can actually take place for him is in the context of civil society, not the state itself. Now, not to say that it can't happen in the state, but it has, to, it has to be counterbalanced by a strong public sphere. And the problem I see in black politics is that all we're concerned about is the democratization of the state and getting more Negroes in the state. And all you get is more of the same shit. Because these Negroes inside of the context of the state don't have the political gravitas to shift the direction or the trajectory of the state or to change its imperatives. It's just pirate. Well, it's not even a pirate. It's symbolic victory. It's all it is. It's impotence. No one can argue that women, in virtue of the fact that there has been a convergence between the state and women's, the women's liberation movement. And now, one can argue at a specific point in time, that movement, it co-aligned with certain interest of the state namely it wasn't that oh well, we, we just want women to be free but the state doesn't work like that the state doesn't give a fuck about people's freedom for real although it gives lip service to it it doesn't really care about people's freedom as much as it cares about meeting its core functions of stability and longevity around its again around the, those core functions national security internal stability external st uh, stability the, the uh, functioning and viable uh, uh, movement of the economy. But the reality is you got a better chance without the state of, of actually influencing the state. You don't want to be co-opted. And a lot of times, Negroes are just co-opted, and that's a problem, okay? Negroes have been co-opted, and we need to stop being co-opted. And then, don't look at us while you're co-opted, and then proselytize to us about how you're pushing the progress forward. It's bullshit. Now, I was born at night. I wasn't born last night. How many times we got to go through this? So I'm tired of going through it. It's time for us to... It's time for us to think differently. That's all. And, and you're right, Marcus. It's time for us to think more sophisticatedly about the political predicament we find ourselves in. And any time there are a group of people, I don't care who they consider themselves to be, the most oppressed, the most educated, whatever, as long as there are a group of people 
who are actively trying to silence you and exclude you from the democratic process through shame, coercion, humiliation, refusal of love or embracement. Those people have to be called out for the frauds that they are. You're not democratic. No. You are oppressive. You are dominating. You are violent. Fascism. Only that's that what it is. That's what it is as far as I'm concerned. But, I mean, you know, you, we can go back. Look, history will be the judge. And I don't think history is going to look kindly upon these people, man. That's just my viewpoint. I don't think so. I don't I, I, I do not think I do not think so. But that's just my opinion. I could I could be wrong because I'm fallible. I'm a human being. I don't know everything. OK, could be very wrong. But I doubt it. I doubt if I'm wrong. <laughs> I doubt it. Now, I'm sympathetic. I'm Look, I'm sympathetic for the inclusion of black people into the state. But it has to be substantive. And right now, it's just a bunch of Negroes rushing to be part of the game. And particularly black women. Oh, we, we got so many black women in these positions. And they're just reproducing white supremacy. They're not changing the game. They're not changing the basic structure of society. It's like animal form. I, look, yeah. look, I, I, bro. I don't want to. I don't want to start calling women pigs or nothing, no shit like that. So let me stop while I'm ahead, man. Well, two things I want to mention. Homeboy came in and he said that the girl blatantly told him, you know, I ain't think about black men. I'm thinking about black women, and that's one thing that you know should be obvious to everyone listening. Um, black women are their own special interest group apart from the rest of Black America, and I, I do mean black men and i do also mean black children it's been like that for a while but they're saying it plain now now separate from that earlier you said you know uh black symbolic figures in government you know don't have any you know uh you know basically you say they don't have any power to make any real changes i i'll go a step further than that i don't i don't i say they don't even have the inclination Oh, I, I, and you know what, Mark? I agree with you. I, look, this is about, this shit ain't nothing but a, a glorified job for these Negroes, man. It's all it is. It's like being part of the NFL or like being part of a Fortune 500 company or, you know, getting a record deal or some shit. It's, it's, this, this shit is about, it's not about substance. This is about, this is about vanity. This is not about changing the basic structure of society. This is about Look at my big ass. Look at my ass. Look how dope I am. And that's not a life of... If you're a politician... Look, let me tell you something. The difference between... And I can't say this is universally true. But I, I will say that the way that we perceive politics contemporarily in America is not the way the ancients perceived politics. Especially the, pe the people who created what we practice as democracy. Because them motherfuckers, man, this is how they looked at public service everybody has to do it like jury duty like you might be called on to be a fucking statesman because you're a member of the fucking society and you are forced to make decisions about what's in the best interest of the entirety of the society of the society in which you live just like jury duty so by a lot people are called upon to serve at various moments but this shit right here is people making a career out of politics. That's the very converse of what politics is supposed to be about. It's not you pursuing your private goals to be successful. This is about a service to humanity. And not just one group of people, but the entirety of humanity. But if you believe, if you think in your head that because if you're free, and if you're doing well, everyone else is going to be doing well by default. If you adopt that as a principle, then all kinds of distortion ensues. Now, I've talked about this on many different occasions. I don't have the time to go into it here. But this is what a lot of these people have been taught to believe. That narcissism, it, but it's not rooted in narcissism, it's rooted in Marxism, to be perfectly, to be perfectly honest. And I don't have a problem with Marxism for those people who actually fucking understand it. Most of these people don't understand it. They never read it. 
They don't know the theories that underlie it. They never read the Grundy's. They never read the Jewish question. They never read, you know, Hegel. They don't even understand this shit. But then they set apart these dichotomies like the pro pro proletariat and the bourgeoisie, and they set up these antagonisms, and all they do is just change the placeholders. And then men take the place of the bourgeoisie and then women, the proletariat. And without any historical nuisance, uh, nuance, nothing. And it's distortion. Think about this. And uh, look. Think about this. So now you got white women who were part of the bourgeoisie class. Part of a racial class of persons who oppressed, dominated, subjected to violence, enacted cultural uh, 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 imperialism, vi uh, uh, powerlessness, violence, all kinds, man, all kinds. Now they get to all of a sudden through Marxism claim to be oppressed themselves. And even black men, the ones that they oppress, become oppressors to them. What type of fucking trickery is this? I, I, I just, man, look, keep it 100. I don't know if you're there or not. I think you keep getting removed or something like that. Uh, but I don't know, like, dude, you keep it. 100. Dog, you fuck, you all fucked up in the game, bro. We're going to see if you get your shit right. But right now, you know, you, you're doing some Matrix type shit if you got two, yeah, two of yourself. You got two of you yourself hear, all up in the joint. I'm right here. Okay. So, 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 so all, all I'm trying to say is look, man. Black men will never be able to impact the world and we'll never be able to educate the masses of black men if we don't tell our stories. And right now, black men aren't telling the stories. There's only a constricted, a bottleneck kind of narrative that's been me? allowed. I can hear you. I hear you fine. Yep. So there's a bottleneck narrative that's being told about our experience and about our lives and about how we're faring in this culture. And it's time for us to tell our stories, man. And that's it, and that's that. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna let you close out, bro, because I don't, I, you know, I ain't even ex expect to be here for an hour thirty. Damn, you, you gone. Hey, look, y'all. Thank you, uh, C Truth, the Revelator, for the donation, and thank you, Afro Analyst, for becoming a new member of the Green Gorilla Channel. I appreciate that. So let me give you a, uh, a formal. a formal uh, endorsement of some kind. And then also, uh, I want to give a shout out to Drizzy Dre. Thank you, sir, for your kind, your kind donation. I love my little sounds, man. I know they silly as hell, but I like, I like them. Yeah, it's all shot, bro. <laughs> You know, it's just a little something to keep it, you know, a little different. And you, you see me coming with the little video cuts and shorts and shit. Yeah, you know, I see, I see you, man. I see you, brother. You know, you know, I did do a little something. something, something. See you, man. I see you, man. Yeah. So, so, so let me let me just say this. So, I have a uh, to change the subject just a little bit, and then we're gonna get the hell up out of here. Thank you for joining us, man. I really appreciate each and every one of you all who've come in and who've joined in on the conversation. But okay, so what I have is I have Final Cut Pro. 10. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, but I'm, you know, like, I, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm not a, a tech guy, but I am a tech guy because I used to produce music. So the video is linear or the editing of video is just as linear as the editing of audio. Okay. Uh, and what I found is, is that I, I don't know how to do like a whole bunch of, uh, special effects and shit like that but i do know how to use the green screen and how to key and how to take things in and out how to layer uh pictures and shit like that uh but not it ain't is it, it ain't as hard as it seems it, it, it's kind of easy uh i'm not you know but the, the only thing is finding assets finding video to actually work with that you could use without paying a motherfucker to use it yeah <laughs> you know what i'm saying that becomes the problem so then you got to go out and shoot footage on your own or you know, uh, you got to use assets of your own and uh, or make up assets of your own. And so that becomes a problem. But this motherfucker, man, like you got to find audio and video to use on social media platforms. And then, you know, I got a copyright strike. I got a few copyright strikes, bro, where people were mm. like, oh, this is my music. 
This ain't your music, nigga. This is my music, nigga. I'm like, hold on. I thought I paid for this shit, B. I thought I had a license. I thought I got a receipt for this, B. <laughs> oh, man. So, so anyway, I do have a license to use it. So all they're going to end up doing is dropping the shit anyway. Then, yeah. word bond, man. Like, I got shit. My own music that got copyright striped. Like, hold on. Wait a minute. Do you, I got a manager in motherfucking somewhere I don't even know about? Wait, you talking about the, the, the I'm a winner? No, not that one, not that oh. joint, but some other joints that I, that, you know, some other joints. But, you know, because I, I got, you know, I, I let you hear some some other of my little joints or whatever the case may be. But I, the the dope thing, though, is I live in Houston, man. I hooked up with some producers and shit, and uh, they, they kind of like my shit. I'm too old to be doing music for real, but I do want to contribute uh, production-wise to whatever they got going on because that just keeps me in the touch with it. And I, I just, like, I love creativity man that's just I'm, i've been on that shit you know and i think you love it too man i mean you're a creative individual man it's just being being around other creators yeah is is, is worth it to me so you mm -hmm. know it is what it is man but yeah man so i'm a little disgruntled with with youtube man they you know you got these you, you're not eligible for monetization i'm like hold on wait a minute bro mm. I just, you know, I, uh, I thought I got this legally. So anyway, man, I, you know, I'm part of this uh, royalty-free music sharing company called Audio Hero. You ever heard of that? I have um, audio.com, and uh, a friend of mine has Epidemic Sound. They got a lot of music and different sound effects and things like that on there, uh, you know. So it's, it's probably similar to to what you're talking about um where you could just you know you got a membership so you could just grab whatever you need on there and then you could download the license they they down they let you download the paperwork so if you get a strike you, all you got to do is uh send youtube the uh the license that you have right so and yeah so that's what i did i just you know i uh i emailed the company that i procured because because i'm part of two buddy so, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I have, a, I think I got a free TubeBuddy account. Um, or maybe I paid for a one-time fee or some shit like that. But I paid for it because it helps you create thumbnails, even though I don't do the thumbnail creation. <laughs> you know, it, but it's, it gives you, like, the ability to analyze your channel with somebody else's channel. And uh, it enables you to have analytics and to see them in ways that you can't see them solely within the confines of YouTube. Uh, so it's helpful in that regard. It helps you to create tag lists and to see other people's tag lists on their videos. So you can thrust your own video up higher into the search uh, SEO, you know, um, shit like that. So I, it's useful. So I, I'm part of Audio Hero through TubeBuddy. And I am an affiliate, but I've never pushed it yet. Uh, but I would suggest that if you do uh, have a YouTube channel, man, that you know you fuck with uh, TubeBuddy or either the other one. Uh, I forget the Audio other Hero. No, not Audio Hero, but the other uh, YouTube company, man. That uh, one of these little YouTube helper, uh, uh, you know, integrated uh, services that that kind of work in conjunction with YouTube. Uh, yeah, so I, got the, you. uh, I, I I can't remember Vid IQ. I think is the other one. Vid IQ. I can't remember, but um they help you you know they, they got these little 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 little, little programs and shit to help you you know optimize your channel and shit like that so gotcha yeah man but anyway man you know uh i'm gonna let you leave it off to the final end man and go ahead and say something then i'm about to get the fuck up out of here bro <laughs> all right well shout out to everybody man you know pretty much you know uh like i've been saying on the last couple of times i've been on this channel you know, it's my belief that, uh, and you know, I hate I hate to say it this way, man. You know, a lot of things I say is pretty, it sounds pretty doom and gloom, but it, a lot of this is real, and we're seeing evidence of it, man. I I I, I am not a believer in, you know, uh, black women wanting a community where, uh, you know, men are the leadership, black men are the leadership. I I I sincerely don't believe that that's what they want, even if. You might hear them say that here and there. Um, I, I think that them wanting the state 
you know, to uh, to be more involved is a conscious uh, request that leadership from their own black men be removed because they don't they 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 want the benefits of patriarchy. Because I seen uh, I think it was Dollar who said in the comments uh, or Damon. One of one of the guys said that you know, black women hate patriarchy. It's not that they hate patriarchy. It's like you've said plenty of times, and I've said over the years, like they hate their obligation to it. You know, they they don't want to play their role in it. You know, they they like patriarchy as far as insofar as what it gives them, but they don't want to reciprocate back into the system. So what what they have opted to do is, you know, to let the state come in and, you know, replace black male leadership because at least with the state, you know, I guess they figure all we got to do is vote for these people. You know, it's nice that you have, you know, a black female vice president. It looks good. It's optics and things like that. It does nothing for you, but at least you get your welfare and you at least you get uh, perceived freedom from black male leadership. They are trying to escape black male leadership, even though they might say, well, you know, men do this, men do that. They don't want your leadership. They want your benevolence. There's a difference. You know, protect and provide. They want the, the benevolent aspects of black male leadership or patriarchy without the leadership and the obligation or the reciprocation that comes with that leadership. Um, As far as, you know, Black female symbolism in government, you know, they, they're, they're happy to see someone who appears to be a black woman as the vice president. And I think that, uh, you know, aside from everything else we're talking about, that was a big reason for having, you know, uh, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden win the election against Trump. I mean, you know, there was a million things at stake for black women in this election and that being one of them. I'm going to be one of the first early people to say this. I don't know if anyone else has said it, but I'm going to say this now. And <clears throat> if I'm wrong, I'll be wrong. But if I'm right, we're going, we're going to have this conversation again. Joe Biden is 77 years old. Before the end of the first term, he will be in his 80s. And he does not appear to me to be in the greatest health that I've ever seen. So y'all motherfuckers better to get ready for the first black female president, quote unquote black female president of America. And I think that that's one of the things that black women were pushing for is to get her in there for the possibility of the biggest black female symbol that they've ever seen for America, the possibility of a black female president. Get ready for it. Break yourself, fool, because it's coming. Oh man, look! I th I thought that came with the territory. Personally, I already. <laughs> I mean, I thought that was the goal from day one. I mean, it's you know, in, in in relation to logistics, but 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 peep game, man. Just 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 look. Be aware. Still a white man's country, man. <laughs> Bottom line, this is a white person's country. This ain't. I, Black women believe that because they are fucking so dedicated to the Democratic Party that the Democratic Party owes them shit. And it owes them something in relation to visibility by means of a token. But, I mean, at the end of the day, man, black women are still among the poorest demographic in the United States. They have the least amount of wealth in the United States. That's just a fact. See, they don't care about that. Well, you know, look, uh, they, they might not care about that, but they they ought to begin to think about that, you know, because in, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many token niggas you got, excuse me for saying that word, but token Negroes, it, it, no matter how many token Negroes you have who've democratized the state, who've become interpolated within the state apparatus at any level, you're still going to perform the functions of the state. Barack Obama was a black imperialist in the United States office. Bottom line, he dropped bombs on Africa. And he fucking signed qualified immunity in the United States to allow police officers to continue to kill Tamir Isis and George Floyds and Breonna Taylors without any punishment 
or any threat of of of, of retaliation. I mean, it's just you know, or punishment for having done so. Yeah, well, in, um, in well all, all, all I'm saying is mm -hmm. a black face in a white space is a white is still beneficial to the white race. Absolutely. And I'm not, just is what it is. I'm not trying to. I'm, I'm not. It just is what it is, bro. So, no, but, but, I, I, but I, I'm with you. I agree with you, hundred percent. So, uh, but look, y'all, uh, we can continue to keep this going, man. Uh, keep it one hundred, man. How can they find you, bro? Because you got your own channel now, man. We need to get that that bitch up. Get it up. What's up? Let them know where you're at. Well, well, uh, you could you could uh let that let the names get back on the screen so they can see how it's spelled. Keep it one hundred. Um, you type in keep it 100 on YouTube and you'll find me, my videos. And, uh, yeah, man, you'll know it's me. The same face that you see right now will be on there. Um, you know, most, most, a lot of the guys in here know me as Marcus Aurelius on Facebook, but, uh, keep it 100, just like that. 100 H U N N E D, you know, keep it 100 is one word. You search, keep it 100 on, uh, YouTube. Pardon that beeping in the background. I'm making these steaks. Um, yes, yeah, smell. I can smell that shit from all the way over here, boy. I got the ribeyes, baby. Oh boy. So yeah, <laughs> man. Just keep yeah, keep it 100. Uh, just drop the video for an hour. You know, an hour long video. Call your way ain't working, and that's my my uh, views on the uh, dysfunctional elements of black culture. Um. You can check that out on my YouTube page, and I'll be doing some live videos this week. So you can check those out, too. Yeah, just add me, man, and uh, you'll see me pop up in your feed, man. You know? Yeah, man. Y'all got to be subscribing to shit, man. Y'all y'all don't be subscribing to shit. So I got to look, look. Let me tell y'all what y'all need to do, man. Check it out, Mark. Check it out. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel. Please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell notification button. And please, feel free to share the video. Thank you. Share the video, man. Like the, like the video, man. Subscribe to the channel, man. Donate to keep the channel going. Because if you don't donate, to the channel, the channel might, you know, go belly up. <laughs> That's just how, you know, how things go, man. You know, so. But anyway, brother, I appreciate your presence here, man. Thank you for coming in, man, and having a conversation with me, man, and carrying Most this stuff, thing man. on out. And uh, no, I'll holler at y'all later, man. I'll see you. Well, I'm, I'm trying to think. Tomorrow I will not be on air. But uh, Thursday I'm going to come back with a conversation about the term toxic masculinity and the origins of the term. And it's not what you think because people think that they know what the term means and they think they know what its origins are, but they're profoundly wrong about that. And then also on Friday, I want to have a conversation with you all about who the true authors of neoliberalism are and who the true authors of the carceral state are. A lot of people think that the Republicans are the ones who issued in, or excuse me, ushered in uh, the current austerity measures and the neoliberal pattern of uh, American capitalism. But it, it wasn't. It was Jimmy Carter who did this. And then beyond that, the carceral state was urged on by Bi uh, Biden and Strom Thurmond. They were the ones who were the architects of, mm. of the uh, legislation that Reagan was forced to take up. I mean, these people were Dixiecrats. They're true to their roots, man. Dixiecrats have also spoken the language of race, and they've also used dog whistle politics in order to garner votes uh, for, uh, for themselves and, and to gain prominence in the Democratic Party. So people should be aware of the fact that the Democratic Party ain't all nice and it's still a plantation. Just understand that it ain't all nice, baby. It no. ain't all gravy, baby. So having said that, I'll holla at y'all later, man. Peace out. Right. No doubt, no doubt. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. I'm a phenomenon.
banana shine like Orion. I came in a rap gang to smack it up like Heron. Transform it like Megatron. Wait, like Yamatron. Most rappers are some peons. I'ma starve them like Ramadan. I'm troublesome. You don't really want no troublesome. Cause I pop guns like hood chick. Do bubble gum. My bin dumb. Gonna stay that way till kingdom come. When the sun I'm at. Unleash a demon of Polygon. I'm heavy, son. Got more knowledge than Farrakhan. More gang than Cap. Come that bitch. Some name done one. Stay lit off some Shandan. Made up a card of rum. Stay great to some Nordstrom. Call me that dapper done. More wider than Genghis Khan. That the mimbers are Taliban. Niggas bigger than Silicon. Get hit like a dot com. Like soldiers in Lebanon. I'm bringing that red rum. When I get to what you son, you gon' think I'll see Ram. Run! I carry weight like a heavyweight. Break more cakes than patty cake. Watch the fiends salivate. You a lightweight. Phantom weight. Better contemplate. If you violate, make you levitate to the pearly gates. I fascinate when I conversate from the show me state. Where these niggas stop the hate and hot murder rate. What the waste. But this flow is just a taste of God's grace. Shining this light in an ugly place. In the prophecy. Got more wisdom than Socrates. Philosophies, you don't really want no parts of me. Can't you see? I'm sticking to Mephistopheles, stronger than Hercules. More dangerous than the third of Damocles. The MCs crying me, pretty please. I wait up they white tees, knock them out they wallabies. Now they touch my deliries. But coming up shorter than little C's when I break out the killer bees. I step the music by Kokasi, hit chicks look like a shanty when I'm breaking them off. They yell at I'm poppy. You rack rappers is sloppy, you can't stop me with that. We can stop it, copy, copy, Malaki. I'm a monster like Frankenstein, rock harder than Palestine. You slam. Dropping down to snake and serpentine Can't stand the steamy glow like Nas with a spit shine All you hate is cold in it, cold sores need calamine But my hot shit like red brick hitting your head Leave your sour taste up in your mouth like lemon heads Like simply red, wasted some years up in the feds When I touch down, hold dirty red, that gave me head I got higher vision for higher living, I'm highly driven I'm acting women like it's some sort of sick religion Driving an Impala sitting on it, he's 20 inches And they spinning just like the planets in the solar system Black country people in Africa, down to America, black country people, uh, we make all the world go round and round, yeah. black country people, uh, up in Canada, down to Jamaica, black country people, uh, we make all the world go round and around.